I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Randy Smallwood, President and CEO of Wheaton Precious Metals. Thanks so much for joining me today. Good pleasure, Charlotte. Thank you. Great. So we're here at the Denver Gold Forum. In your presentation yesterday, you described 2018 as a foundation year for your company. You said your production is only going to increase moving forward. Where is that growth going to come from? Well, yeah, it's a foundation year. We had a couple of term contracts that uh, that expired uh, both the middle of last year and then early this year we stopped receiving the compensation over in Pasqualama. So so that brought us down to a level slightly below where our production was last year. But we've got some real strong growth coming organically from, uh, uh, first off, some acquisitions we made this year, um, which is on the creative side. But, but Penasquito itself, uh, we see, you know, um, here in the fourth quarter, we should see an increase in production as the pyrite leach circuit comes on. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, we've made the acquisition of, of Stillwater, where we're going to start getting palladium and uh, and gold, uh, starting on July 1st. Uh, so it's already uh, it's already commenced. We're receiving uh, um, growth from there. Um, we've got 2019 should be a good year for us down at the Constancia project. Uh, we, you know, Papa Concha Zone should be coming on, and that's got much higher grades, and so we should see an increase in gold there. And we're looking forward to um, sometime before the end of this year, we expect Valet to announce the third phase of expansion at Salobo. And uh, with that expansion, um, it looks like the base case will be about a 50% increase in, uh, in, in production. And uh, I know the numbers look pretty favorable. They haven't made the formal decision yet, but we're expecting that very soon. And of course, that, uh, that mine, uh, we currently get about 240,000 ounces of gold per year from that mine at a $400 cash cost. And so, so an expansion um, up to... Uh, 50% would be a significant uh, uh, move. So, um, yes, things are looking very good from here on out. That's great. So definitely you've got opportunities for organic growth optionality. I would imagine you're also going to be looking to sign more streaming deals. You've made agreements with some major players this year. Should investors be expecting more of the same? Yeah, the current market is, it's actually, I think we've, uh, in fact, I'd say the Sabanya deal was the last of the balance sheet repair type deals where uh, where the money was used to, to help strengthen uh, or delever their balance sheet. Um, so most of what we're looking at now is actually development projects. But, uh, you know, we have seen some weakness in commodity prices, and so most companies are sort of exploring financial means of, of funding that growth, but uh, but they're not pulling the trigger yet in terms of actually uh, uh, starting that growth. So we're busy. We've, uh, you know, there's not a lot of capital out there, and we are a source of capital, and so we've got a lot of companies presenting projects to us. As always, we'll be very selective, um, but uh, yeah, we're hopeful to uh, add on a few more uh, streams uh, sometime over the next uh, couple of years. Okay. I'm curious as to whether you'd ever look at streaming deals with companies in Australia. We seem to be seeing more and more of companies from there in the news lately and even at this conference. What do you think? Yeah, we've uh, we've actually, over the course of our 14-year history, we've been to Australia numerous times uh, and come very close in terms of streaming transactions. Uh, we've just never been able to close the uh, close the deal. Uh, one way or the other, the uh, the uh, you know for some reason the deal just doesn't happen, and so we're still very eager in Australia. Um, you know the industry is doing very well down in and 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 it's well respected. Australia is a jurisdiction that we're very very comfortable with in terms of uh, political risk and and such, and so um, so yeah we we continue to pursue uh, opportunities in Australia. Okay, very interesting. The last time we spoke with you, just back in the summer at the Sprott Conference in Vancouver, we actually had somebody write in afterwards and ask why we didn't have you share an update on your CRA tax dispute. Can you tell us where you're at with that right now? Yeah, it's, um, you know, just, just as a clarification, um, our company is, uh, is based in Canada and we have uh, uh, streams on Canadian mines and we have streams on mines outside of Canada. Uh, we are fully taxable on any of the Canadian mine production mm -hmm. and um, you know, expect to pay taxes in Canada for that Canadian mine production. However, what uh, our position is is that any Canadian or any, any production that comes from outside of Canada should not be taxable in Canada, typical of anyone in the resource industry. And so that's what we're fighting. The CRA is, uh, mm -hmm. has uh, reassessed us and, and what they're trying to do is capture all our foreign income and bring it into Canada for taxation, which is... Uh, we uh, we will defend that vigorously in terms of uh, not letting that go forward. So so we're currently um, just finishing off the discovery process. We've pretty well supplied everything off. Uh, we do have a trial date set for September of 2005 or sorry of 2019. 
Um, and so we would expect if, if it goes to trial, and I say if because we are uh, working towards a, a solution, or a negotiated settlement, uh, however, it takes two to get to that point, and we haven't seen that uh, that support or that interest yet from the uh, government side or from the um, Ministry of Justice lawyers representing the CRA. But uh, so, in the event that we don't settle, uh, we expect to go into trial in September of 2019, and that would give us a decision sometime by the end of 2020. Again, we are no different than any other uh, Canadian-based resource company that has international investments, and so uh, so we're very, very confident in our position uh, and expect to get this resolved. We are trying to do it as fast as we can. Unfortunately, the CRA is not a very uh, rapid-moving entity. So, Sure. Okay. Hopefully that's a helpful update for everybody. Yes. Uh, let's end by talking about the silver price. What's your take on activity this year, and what do you expect for the next few months as we head into the end of the year? Silver is uh, dramatically underperformed. Everyone, every other precious metal uh, in in, this, in in the precious metal space, and uh, and uh, it it is a bit puzzling because the fundamentals behind silver are probably the more more attractive. I mean, we're we're seeing in excess of sixty percent of silver now being consumed in high efficiency uh, electronics, and uh, um, and so we see you know excellent demand on that side. Uh, we we. I believe we've seen peak silver production too. We, we just don't see growth on the silver side. Most silver comes as a byproduct of lead zinc mines, and there's not very many new lead zinc mines coming on stream. Most of what we look at in the base metal space is the copper mines, and not uh, not too many new lead zinc deposits. So, so we do think we've seen peak silver production, and we see increasing industrial demand, and all of those should add up to a pretty strong silver price. And yet, the gold silver ratios we're looking at right now are near record highs, and um, so. I do think that uh, when it moves, it's going to move very strongly. Um, we are seeing, obviously, some strength in the U.S. dollar, uh, and we are seeing some, some changes. I don't think the strength in the U.S. dollar is sustainable. I think uh, you know, some of it's related to, to some short-term tax, uh, tax benefits that have been uh, you know, funded into the, uh, into the, into the country. So, so not long-term sustainable. We should be able to uh, um, see some good movement here sometime in the next couple of years. And, and silver always outperforms. Uh, gold, it always outperforms other precious metals. Uh, unfortunately, it does it in both directions, and it's finished outperforming down. Now it's going to outperform on the way up. Okay, and gold moving kind of in the same direction? Yeah, gold is definitely, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't have the same industrial demand, but as an investment base, as a store of value, is, uh, it's, it's definitely a very, very strong commodity that, uh, that, that uh, you know, I would think in these times should be... Uh, should be a core part of uh, everyone's investment portfolio, and uh, and I do think this is the best time to invest into it. We're we're definitely, you know, uh, as close to a bottom as I've seen. Yeah, that was going to be my final question. Is it time to invest? Sounds like the answer is yes. Definitely. I, uh, you know, I, I think that we at, at Wheaton have put together probably one of the best options for investing into precious metals in terms of the lack of. And how we control our risks, how we bring down the uh, the risks of different uh, investments. We uh, you know there's no surprises on the capital costs, no surprises on the operating costs, and and we have good organic growth, and we're very disciplined in terms of investing into high quality assets. We pay a healthy dividend, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, we've just got an excellent track record of delivering value back to our shareholders, and we will get through this CRA issue. So um, altogether, that just adds up to an excellent time to step into the space. Okay, well, thank you so much. That's all from me. Once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is Randy Smallwood with Wheaton Precious Metals.